This week, we talk with internationally renowned economist Jeff Rubin about his new book, A Map of the New Normal, How Inflation, War, and Sanctions Will Change Your World Forever. Make Better Wealth Decisions, a podcast that explores how financial advisors' blind spots can harm your investments. I'm your host, John DeGuy, a portfolio manager with Design Securities in Toronto. In this podcast, we'll provide advice on how you can achieve better outcomes by maximizing investments and minimizing taxes. Let's put our thinking caps on as we consciously decide to get smarter about our money. Jeff Rubin is a Canadian economist and author. He's the former chief economist at CIBC World Markets and is currently senior fellow at the Center for International Governance Innovation. A map of the new normal, how inflation, war, and sanctions will change your world forever, was released in May. The book explores how central banks' actions during the COVID-19 crisis set economies on a track for massive inflation in commodities and in wages and with other knockoff effects as well. Jeff, welcome. Welcome. Good to be here. This is your fifth book. And I'm wondering if you are thinking about these themes often. Have you? It seems as though you often write about geopolitics from the perspective of how it's going to have knockoff effects on the economy. Can you maybe, maybe give us a quick summary, a very quick summary of the book itself? This book follows my last book, The Expendables, which focuses on how globalization had decimated the middle classes in countries like Canada, the United States, OECD, and talked about how Trump was trying to change that and the irony in him being the apostle of the American working class, because obviously he doesn't come from that class background. So this is, in a sense, a continuation of the story. It's actually a different book than what Penguin Random House originally commissioned me to write. Uh, What they originally commissioned me to write was going to be called, Is There Any Light at the End of the Tunnel? And it was to describe the economic legacy of the pandemic. For example, the work at home syndrome and how that's impacted office vacancy rates. But maybe four or five months into the book, Russia invaded Ukraine, and the response was, in the words of President Biden, the greatest sanctions ever imposed. And it seemed like the aftershocks of the pandemic was not the right story to be writing about. So fortunately, my publisher, Penguin Random House, and I agreed that we'd switch gears. And I was able to maybe retain the first three, four chapters of the book talking about the fiscal and monetary expansion to pay for all the pandemic spending in this book. But this book charted a very different course, and it explores what the real impact of sanctions uh, have been. And while sanctions were advertised as something that would bring America's enemies, Russia, China, to their knees, The real casualty of sanctions has been the world trading order, which we've been told it was the basis of our collective prosperity. Because if Ricardo's dictum of comparative advantage is supposed to make everyone better off, then sanctions do the opposite. They make everyone worse off. And unlike the pandemic, which was a black swan event. I mean, it came out of nowhere. It was devastating, but ephemeral. This is not ephemeral. This is a new world order. This is something that's going to be with us long after the war in Ukraine is over. And there may well be other battlefronts because what we're talking about is the collision of massive geopolitical plates and where they buckle Ukraine, Straits of Taiwan, Gaza, who knows where else. It's not so much the buckling, it's the clash of tectonic plates. That's the real story here. It's funny because I can't help but to notice that when I, my book here, Bullshift, I started writing it right when COVID hit as well. And I had to change it a lot because of the way things evolve. 
But I just wanted to read one paragraph from the back here because you'll see how you and I think so much alike. And that is this. Unfortunately, this problem affects much more than your own investment portfolio. After three years of an international pandemic, the full economic impact of the response to it still hasn't been felt. There's more pain coming, but the financial industry's eternal optimism abetted by government policies designed to continuously encourage growth and to avoid tough choices is walking us toward a cliff for the global economy. That seems, that sounds to me, what I wrote, an awful lot, a lot, what, like what you wrote. And it's funny because in an Applebaum's book, Twilight of Democracy, she says much the same thing. And in Nouriel Roubini's book, Mega Threats, it's like there's a real consensus. I'm just a guy who writes, but people like you and Rubini and Applebaum are global thought leaders. There's a real consensus among global thought leaders that the world has changed. But the problem that I'm noticing is that I don't think the average person has really clued into this. Most people are still blithely going about their lives as though nothing is materially different. And I'm wondering why the cognitive dissonance? Can you maybe offer some thoughts on that? We've been told for the last 40 years that globalization is not only beneficial, but inevitable, immutable, okay? Mm -hmm. When you're told that repeatedly, you naturally believe it. And I think doubts occurred during the pandemic when just-in-time inventories became just too late inventories or never arrived inventories. And we weren't talking about lawn chairs and tennis shoes. We were talking about desperately needed ventilators and vaccines and masks and the world's worst, worst health crisis since the Spanish flu after the First World War. That got us thinking. A lot of people think that because the physical disruption of supply chains during the lockdown is over, it's back to normal. Guess what? Where the new supply chains are sprouting isn't where the old supply chains lay. And that's the difference between offshoring the very essence of globalization, which was the massive transfer of highway jobs from advanced industrial countries to developing countries like China with friendshoring. And friendshoring turns Ricardo's theory of comparative advantage on its head because trade is no longer driven by cost and comparative advantage. Trade is driven by the political position of the government of the country in question. And that's a very different world economy than the economy that we've known for the last four decades. When you talk about supply chains, I don't think anyone really has come to the realization that the inflation that we're seeing in 2024 is uh, a latent uh, effect that's not likely to go away because the supply chains that were keeping prices down have been broken. And the French shoring has basically uh, allowed the world to get to this new normal where everything just costs more because instead of doing what Ricardo would say is having the comparative advantage of whatever's cheap, you will do that with the variation of whatever's cheap from amongst your friends. But if your friends cost three or four or five times more than your former neutral people that you didn't get into geopolitical spats with, that's still going to be very inflationary for prices. And I'm just wondering, when you hear people talk about this in Canada and the U.S., throughout the Western world, the impression I get is that they, they will blame other things. They'll, they'll blame real estate prices. They'll blame the pandemic. They'll blame the government. But I don't think there are many people who have really come to the conclusion that this is due to the new world order where supply chains have been fundamentally disrupted and changed, and that is not going to go away maybe ever. Why don't people recognize that impact? It really wasn't clear to me how severe it was until I read your book. And then I was like, oh, my goodness, how could I have missed this? John, as you can appreciate, we're at war and yeah. at war comes propaganda. And that's my opening chapter, The Fog of War, okay? And it's not the first time and it's not the last time. And guess what? Authoritarian countries don't have a monopoly on propaganda. It's just done a little differently over here. Okay, so the dots haven't been connected for us because they're inconvenient connections for the powers that be, okay? But the fact of the matter is that 
inflation has now metastasized. Mm -hmm. It's like a local tumor that starts out as an oil and food price shock. Because when you sanction the world's largest energy exporter and grain exporter, guess what? There are consequences for alternative right. supply. And we saw that every time you go into a grocery store or you fill up your tank. And that drove inflation to levels that we haven't seen since the OPEC oil shocks. Now, they've come crashing down, but something has happened. Inflation has now gone from a local tumor, food and energy prices, into a cancer throughout your body. And it takes the form of wages. Okay. Mm -hmm. Wages like wage settlements in the United States from collective bargaining agreements were like 7.3% last year. You got to go back to 1988 to see the last time wages were growing that rapidly. Wages don't just affect the price of oil or the price of grain. Wages affect the price of everything. So that's why we're seeing poor inflation now higher than actual inflation because of the collapse in food and energy inflation. Core inflation is going to be very resilient. Now, the question you got to ask yourself is, why are suddenly wages growing at rates that we haven't seen for decades? Because the single biggest break on wages, which also happened to be the single biggest break on inflation, was the ability of employers to just shut down their factory when workers went on strike for a higher wage and move that factory to places like China, where not only were wages not growing as fast, they were one-tenth of the wages that they were paying back home. Now, of course, you can't do that because mm -hmm. China is not our trading partner. China is our enemy and we don't trade with our enemy. And either through sanctions or crippling tariffs, we're going to block our enemies' exports to us, just like in the old days when there was quotas, you know, on stuff like textile. So that's given domestic labor bargaining power that they have not seen for decades. And if you look at strike activity in Canada and the United States, it's like the highest it's been in decades. And they're winning these strikes. Yeah. So the, there is a good side to this. If you are one of the few remaining members of the middle class holding a decent paying factory job, you get a reprieve from a certain death set because, you know, all of a sudden jobs are coming back home. Jobs that we were told would never come back home and they never would have come back home in the old global trading order, but friend shoring's bringing them home. So the good news story is that we're going to see a recovery in factory employment. We're going to see a recovery in factory wages. We're going to see, dare I say, a, a recovery in the ranks of the middle class. But everything that we used to buy in China, from China that we produce now, whether it's a semiconductor or a kettle, is going to cost a multiple, not more, a multiple of what we're used to paying. It's, so it's, it's, inflation is the new normal. Sure, there'll be, you know, cycles of commodity prices as there always is. But basically, systemically, inflation is back. It's very intrinsic to the new world order. And for all intent and purposes, French shoring equals wage inflation. And it's funny because wage inflation in many ways hasn't even gone up as much as I would have expected it was. I don't know if you know who Robert Reich is. He was the minister, the, yeah, uh, the minister of labor for Clinton, and he's a uh, emeritus prof over at Berkeley. And he's been tweeting about this for years, how the U.S. minimum wage still has not budged for the past 14 or 15 years, even as prices have gone up and even as French shoring is a very real thing. So I cannot help but think that rages, we haven't even seen the beginning of it yet. That, we're that in wage, like the top of the third. Is, yeah. Okay. We're, we're in the top just of getting the third. Started. Okay. Yeah. So let's move this to Canada for a very brief moment. We've just had our second rate cut recently. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you could weigh in as to why Canada is cutting now when the U.S. still hasn't. 
and what that might look like, say, for the remainder of 2024 in terms of monetary policy in Canada. And if you want to weigh in for the U.S., that would be fine, too. Yeah, I guess the first question, if you're asking, so what do I think of the recent Bank of Canada rate cut on top of the previous one? But it all depends. If 2% inflation is no longer the target, and I think it's no, it should no longer be the target, it's fine. But if 2% inflation is the target, excuse me, but 4% wage growth is incompatible with 2% inflation. So I would argue, and I don't think this view is shared by the Bank of Canada or for that matter, the Federal Reserve Board, that the previous 2% inflation target, which has pretty well been the inflation target for every major central bank in the world, was calibrated to the pre-COVID, pre-sanctions world. Today, the post-sanctions world is an entirely different animal. I don't think that 2% inflation in the post-sanctions world is achievable on a sustained basis. So then the question would be, why sacrifice potentially hundreds of thousands, if not millions of jobs to slow the economy down to achieve an inflation target that's unsustainable, okay? The Bank of Canada, I can't speak for the Bank of Canada, but I would be flabbergasted if they went, we agree, Jeff. They'll go, while they cautioned, as the Fed has, that interest rates will not go back to the levels that we saw during the lockdown, Uh, they are saying we're back at the 2% target as if nothing has changed in the world that might impact price behavior. So again, to your question, I don't think these rate cuts are consistent with a 2% inflation target. And time will tell. Okay, I think that the Bank of Canada will have to halt these rate cuts because inflation, particularly core inflation, will not give it the cover that it needs. Okay, if the Bank of Canada were to have a quantum change and the governor announced, and what I say for the Bank of Canada would be equally applicable to the Reserve Mm -hmm. Bank of Australia or the Federal Reserve Board, if the governor of the Bank of Canada were to hold a conference saying, in view of the changes in the way that our economy is operating, and in particular, the dismantling of the single biggest break on inflation in the last 40 years, offshoring, we are recalibrating our inflation target and hence adjusting monetary conditions according. I've yet to hear that announcement, And there are other things that I still haven't really heard, even in the investment community. We've had a 40-year-long bull market in bonds because of inflation being very high and Paul Volcker wrestling it down starting in the very late 70s up until a couple of years ago. And now the the new normalization of higher rates means that the 40-year bull market in, in income is over. And I get the sense that there are still a lot of people who are giving advice to retail clients who haven't quite come to terms with that. At least a lot of investors haven't really realized that. Some have, but not all. And then similarly, we've had an inverted yield curve that's that's been the reality for over a year in both Canada and the US. And I'm not exactly sure that's going to change. I just think the environment for investing is challenged as a result of this new world order as well. And the the sense I get, given that the bulls have been running for some time, is that there's a lot of optimism bias. A lot of people just are putting their head in the sand and haven't really come to terms with the fact that things have changed. And just because the market hasn't had a major downturn yet, they're, they're now thinking that, well, because it hasn't happened, it won't happen. And I always like to refer to this as the unpunctual recession. I'm still by no means convinced that we are out of the woods and that we're not going to have a recession. I still think it's not only possible, but probable. But to hear most pundits offer their thoughts, investors and advisors are blithely going about their business and they don't seem worried. And and I'm worried that people aren't worried. So are you worried, Jeff? I guess the problem is these days, nobody really knows what normal should be in the fixed Uh income market. Okay. You refer to an inverted yield curve. Typically, 
as an inverted yield curve usually precedes a recession because the fixed income markets quite rightfully discount central bank rate cuts to stimulate the economy. Curiously, no one is calling for a recession right now. What is the rationale for these multiple rate cuts from the Bank of Canada or the Federal Reserve Board that would justify the inversion? When you get right down to it, they'll show you a chart. Every time interest rates have soared by X hundred basis points, as they have, then there's a reversal. But what they're not taking into account is the starting point of that huge run-up in interest rate. Curiously, in the middle of the largest fiscal deficit since World War II as a percentage of GDP, the 10-year Treasury or 10-year Government of Canada bond was a half a percent. Who in their right minds would have bought those bonds? And as your audience knows, the price of a bond is inversely related to its yield. So right. when bonds are at all-time low yields, guess what? They're at all-time high prices. Was it insurance companies? Was it pension plans? Was it retail investors? No, it was the Bank of Canada. They were, or the Federal Reserve Board elsewhere. Yeah. The bank was buying $3 billion worth of government of Canada bonds at ridiculously low yields. In fact, Christie of Freeland, after tabling a $300 billion plus deficit, bragged about how tax revenues as a debt servicing as a percentage of tax revenues were at an all time low. She neglected to mention that's because I told the governor of the Bank of Canada to buy these bonds at an egregiously high prices. OK, so what I'm saying is, yes, there was a huge run up hundreds of basis of points of rate hikes in a 10 year Canada. But it was coming from a ridiculously, absurdly contrived low. At one point, the Bank of Canada owned almost all of, half of the bonds outstanding. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, John, in my prior life as the chief economist of a major investment bank, I would go around the world after every budget and I would try to sell the bonds. Right? That's what chief economists do. Okay. And, you know, back in those days, there was a very strong relationship. The bigger the borrowing program, the higher the yield that the government had to pay. The principle is called supply and demand, and it works in setting the price of government borrowing as it does in the price of everything else. And that kept government spending in check because if it went nuts, then all of a sudden taxpayers' revenues were going to bondholders instead of you know, both getting program spending. But that relationship totally disappeared in the pandemic. The opposite occurred. The more the government spent, the lower they would pay to borrow the money. And that's only because of quantitative easing, which is just a fancy word for printing money. The American economist Milton Friedman, the father of the monetary school, famous dictum was, Inflation is everywhere and at all times a monetary phenomenon. That never rung truer than during the pandemic. The narrow measure of money supply, M1 in Canada, grew by about 40%. And all that liquidity sloshing around was a powder keg, just waiting to be lit. And the biggest sanction since World War II on the world's number one food and energy exporter, blew that powder keg sky high. Let's see if we can turn from bonds to stocks, because I want to ask you the same question as it pertains to the stock market. We've had a situation where, because oftentimes valuations are work in inverse to the risk-free rate, and, and when bonds are paying very little, and when T-bills are paying very little, stock valuations tend to get very high, which is to say risky. And if you use something like, say, the cyclically adjusted price earnings ratio, the CAPE, for the S&P 500, in late July, we're looking at a number that's around 35, when the historical CAPE is less than half that, maybe 16 or 17, which is another way of saying the stock market is more than doubly overvalued or it could lose 50% and still be fairly valued. Do you think people have come to terms with 
high valuations and the fact that this new normal probably will not be able to sustain these valuations if it persists much longer? Let's understand the foundations of these valuations. As you know, in anyone's portfolio, fixed income and equity are alter competing alternatives. And what we have seen with quantitative easing, and not just this ground, but go back to 2007, 2008, is the biggest winner from quantitative easing has been the stock market. And that has led to criticism of distributional bias, because unlike housing, which also benefits from quantitative easing, 65% of households in North America own a home. 80% of publicly listed stocks are owned by 10% of the population. There's a distributional bias. But when you crush down yields to the levels that they are, you got to realize that as an equity investor, you're swimming with the stream. Okay. When yields go up to five, six, seven percent on a 10 year government bond yield, you're swimming against the current. And there's a huge difference between those two things. I think that this market, I think the equity market is just as vulnerable as the mortgage market to the yield curve inversion unwinding. Okay. Let's see if we can stop it there, Jeff, because you've got so much information. I'm going to see if I can invite you back for the second half. So I want to thank you for your time today. And we'll pick it up again at the, in the next episode. John DeGuy is a portfolio manager with Design Securities in Toronto. The views expressed in this program are not to be construed as specific advice. It is recommended that you consult a qualified advisor before taking action. His books, The Professional Financial Advisor 4, Stand Up to the Financial Services Industry and Bullshift are available through Amazon and in bookstores throughout Canada. You can reach John at 647-STAND-UP, that's 647-782-6387, or at jdegui at designedsecurities.ca.